Today I want to talk about domain-specific language implementation and in particular about the style of an internal DSL. This is going to be our running example, a DSL for finite state machines. So we imagine that this DSL may have started on the whiteboard and now we are interested in implementing it properly in some programming language. So more specifically, we have in mind a finite state machine for a turnstile, like in a metro system. So the turnstile might be locked or unlocked. So passengers might insert tickets. These tickets might get collected. An alarm might get triggered and so on and so forth. So here's a summary of the language concepts at hand. So generally with finite state machines, we have states, events, actions, and transitions. And so for our turnstile FSM, we might have the states that it's locked or unlocked or it's in an exceptional state. And events, uh, those trigger transitions between states, events include the case indeed that someone inserts a ticket, someone is going through the turnstile. And other events and actions include the case that a, a ticket is collected or maybe ejected or that an alarm is triggered. So now we want to also understand the uh, semantics of our finite state machines. Let's say the input output behavior. Uh, so the idea is that we can basically throw events as input uh, at a finite state machine and in return we get some output that is a sequence of actions. So for example, we could insert a ticket while we might try to insert another ticket and we might try to pass and maybe someone else is trying to pass. And actually, if we had this sequence of events here, this would be the corresponding sequence of actions. So the first ticket would indeed be collected, the second ticket would be ejected. And uh, the first attempt of someone going through would just silently be accepted, but of course the turnstile would lock again. So the second person trying to go through would trigger an alarm. So this is the input output behavior for a finite state machine. Now we want to implement the domain specific language and there are two major styles that we could uh, commit to. So either it's going to be an external DSL or an internal DSL. In the case of an internal DSL, and that shall be our focus here, we essentially implement the domain specific language as a library um, in some host language. So uh, in external DSL, and we will not talk much about this here, we would uh, provide a designated parser, uh, basically a you know, completely uh, standalone implementation of the DSL. So really we want to focus here on implementing a DSL transparently, so to say, as a library in an existing language. We are going to use Java and Python. That is, we will have different implementations of the finite state machine language, um, one in Java, one in Python. And we should mention that details of internal DSL style, of course, depend quite a bit on the host language. So we might have a slightly different approach if we were using C++, Scheme, Haskell, or yet other host languages. But we will focus here on relatively straightforward implementations in Java and Python. As a starting point, we might assume a very imperative, naive Java API. So we've got classes, FSM, state, and transition. And we construct objects of these classes, and we use setters, and we manipulate collections to construct our turnstile FSM. This imperative code, which also uses helper variables here, um, is of course quite low level and it's not so easy to see what's going on. Uh, we will improve on this. In fact, a simple way to improve on it is to use functional constructors, that is constructors that receive appropriate arguments so we can construct transitions and states much more directly here without invoking too many setters. Nevertheless, this is still not so nice because uh, the object-oriented representation of finite state machines is uh, clearly revealed here. And also there's some repetitive uh, code patterns going on here. 
so we might want to improve on this further. We will do in a second. But for now, let's just implement a simple object model that serves the API that we just have used. That is, we have classes FSM, state, and transition. And we have all the appropriate attributes here and getters and setters. Uh, and of course, we also have functional constructors here for state and for transition so that we can conveniently construct our FSM. Okay, so this is the baseline implementation. Now, what we actually want is we want a more fluent style of constructing uh, FSMs. Uh, so it could be uh, like this, so that we have like a factory method here to construct or to initiate construction of an FSM. And then we have these methods here, add state, add transition, to keep on adding indeed states and transitions. And everything is lined up through method chaining. So we have one big expression here rather than a long sequence of imperative statements with local variables. So this is much more readable and uh, much more fluent, so to say. Uh, we also have uh, uh, some implicit parameter going on here. So we don't repeat the source state in these transitions because we just assume that the most recently constructed state is the source state for all the subsequent uh, transitions being added. Also, we don't specify the initial state here because we just assume that the first state added is the initial state. So this is a much nicer way of hosting um, uh, the finite state machine language within uh, Java. And by the way, it can also look pretty much the same in uh, Python. So this is the Python counterpart. We use pretty much the same tricks here. And if we were using C++, Scheme, or Haskell, we might use yet additional language constructs to make it look even nicer or maybe differently but that shall not be our topic here today. So this is the actual API in the case of Java. So we've got an interface, FSM, with the add state, the add transition method. And we also add two members here for observation, get initial and make transition, so that we can also access basically the constructed FSM and retrieve information about it. So we need a helper type here because when we make a transition, I mean, according to a current state and a given event, uh, we get in return the action, if any, that's triggered by this transition and also the new target state. Okay, this is the helper type here. Now here's an implementation of the Fluent API. Uh, let's not get lost too much in details here, but the overall idea is that we maintain the initial state we maintain a current state so that we can use it in transitions being added. We use basically a cascaded, sorry, a nested, let's say, um, hash map to map current state and event to an action state pair. And so when we add a state, yes, we check that if we had no initial state so far, then this is the first state probably. And so this is going to be the initial state. And whatever state we add, it's going to be the current state for all subsequent transitions. We do some error handling here. And other than that, we just uh, keep track of the state in our hash map. And also when we add a transition, we also do some error handling here. And we just keep track of the transition in the hash map. And while we can easily retrieve the initial state because we maintain a corresponding attribute, and the make transition method is essentially just a lookup from the hash map plus some error handling we don't discuss here. Okay. So actually what we have so far, we can test it. So here's a JUnit test case. Uh, we assume that we have some input here that is some event sequence and some expected output that is some action sequence. And we assume that we have a run method on top of the make transition method that we just discussed. So we can check that if we take our turnstile FSM and the input, we indeed get the output as expected. Okay, we should look at this run method. And here it is. So the run method indeed is just a straightforward loop over some given input. 
and it uses in each iteration, it uses the make transition method from the Fluent API to basically look up the action state pair for the given state and for the given event. Okay, very straightforward. And by the way, here's also an implementation of the Fluent API in Python. This time around, we only implement at state and at transition, but we do not provide methods like get initial and make transition. Well, that's sort of an arbitrary decision. The assumption is here that we maintain, as you can see, we maintain uh, the FSM by means of a dictionary-based data structure, and we just don't mind uh, exposing this dictionary based data structure, so anyone can just manipulate it directly and uh, observe it and thereby achieve pretty much the same thing that we exported through the make transition method previously. Okay. Accordingly, there's also an alternative implementation of the run function here so that we get also an interpreter in Python. It's a little bit more verbose because indeed we now have to uh, access the dictionary-based data structure in, in more detail. In the end, we also loop over some input here, and we just look up um, the corresponding transition for the given uh, event and for the current state, and so on and so forth. So quite similar to the situation in Java. Now, at this point, we have essentially implemented the syntax of the finite state machine language by means of a Fluent API. We also have implemented what's called the dynamic semantics of the language, well, by means of an interpreter. So now if you wonder what would be a minimum complete DSL implementation, then uh, what we sort of are missing still at this point is what you might call well-formedness or well-typedness or static semantics. So we might want to collect additional constraints we want to impose on DSL programs for them to be uh, sensible, for them to be executable in a reasonable way. So uh, here's a list of uh, well-formedness constraints for finite state machines. So we want to require that all the state IDs of the different state declarations, they should be distinct. Otherwise, we might be confusing some states. Uh, we only want to have one initial state. Uh, the transitions should be deterministic. That means that for any given state uh, and any given event in that state, there should be at most one transition. Okay. All the target states showing up in transitions, they should be resolvable. And all the states declared should be reachable from the initial state. Otherwise, we have some sort of that code. And here's one example of a finite state machine that seems to violate the constraint of all target states to be resolvable, because here, obviously, we have a transition which mentions state C, but state C is never declared. Now, what we do, of course, is we implement all these constraints by appropriate functions. So here's the Python-based implementation. Um, so we have at the top level, we have an OK function, which takes an FSM. And then we apply a bunch of functions here, one per constraint to the FSM. And the idea is that the functions throw an exception if the corresponding constraint is violated. So in effect, we just uh, Access, we just traverse over the um, dictionary based data structure in this case, and we just figure out whether the corresponding constraint is satisfied. So, for example, here for checking that all the state declarations have different state ideas, we indeed just check that there is not multiple declarations with the same state. Okay? And one of the more complex constraint implementation concerns that all states are reachable from the initial state because we sort of have to compute some sort of closure as to how transitions um, make all the states reachable 
but um, we will not specify all the details here. Okay, so that's it. So we have implemented the finite state machine language as an internal DSL. All the code shown and even more code uh, is available online uh, from YAS. And a topic discussed here that is internal DSL implementation, in particular of the finite state machine language, is discussed in more detail in chapter two of the software languages book. Okay, thanks.